So David, the Charlottesville community knows you as a feature writer for the Daily Progress, but I'd like to start out talking a little bit about your past. Tell us about joining the Army. No, I can't tell you about that. <laughs> <laughs> You'd have to shoot me? <laughs> um, well, That's sort of true. <laughs> I was uh, somewhat of a disaster. Well, I was a disaster in high school. Uh, I decided to join the Army when I was 17, and my parents were happy to <laughs> sign off on that. And uh, I went in, and um, my first tour was in Korea. And then I came back, and uh, I wasn't back but a couple months, and um, I was assigned the 1st Cavalry Division, and uh, they'd come down with the orders, and this is 1965 for Vietnam, so I went over, huh. started there, really. So you stayed in the Army for a couple of years, left, and then came back to join the jump school? Yeah, I, um, I was in for three years, and then I had a break of about nine months, and. Um, and that wasn't really working out. I, there was um, a lot of residue left um, from Vietnam. Mm -hmm. um, I'd been in some major battles and um, coming back from that, I remember when I first got home the first night, I kept opening up the refrigerator and shutting the door because it was so foreign to me that I could just reach in and grab a cold whatever and just the lights and all that, because I'd basically been in the field for a year. Right. So um, I just didn't adjust. I, and uh, after nine months, I decided to go back in. And um, there had been a lot of paratroopers in the first cabin. I really liked those guys. And so I said, if I'm going back in, I want to you know, at least try to be a paratrooper. So when I was in jump school, the instructor came up and said, if any of you guys think you want to be snake eaters, which it calls special forces guys, okay. that guy will you know, talk to you. So everybody, 200 guys go over. Out of those 200 guys took the test, six of us came down for orders for special forces. And out of those six guys, two of us graduated oh. um, about a year later. Why do you think you made it? It was a miracle. It, it, this is a completely, um, you can watch as many programs on television about special forces training, but until you actually go through it, you have absolutely no idea. And every day, you're being tested in one way or another. And the, the perfect example of this is I was there for about a month in training and uh, I was uh, changing a light bulb. A light bulb had burned out in the hallway in the barracks. And uh, one of the, the glow-in-the-dark guys, these are the guys that teach us. These are the guys who have to accept you into the family. Mm. Um, he said, give me that. And so handed him a light bulb. He smashed it on the floor. He picked up this big shard of glass. He handed it to me and he says, eat it. And I took this shard of glass and I put it in my mouth and I bit down on it, fully expecting it to cut me up. But it turned into little granules of sand, completely harmless, which he obviously knew. But he, this was a test and he just kind of nods and walks away. Try to explain to me the difference between a soldier and a Green Beret. In our creed, it says, we will never surrender though we be the last, which means we die in place. There's, we don't surrender. We die in place. It doesn't matter if we're the last. And I think a country has to have those kind of people with that kind of mentality is that we don't surrender. And if you're going to take us on, you are going to pay, and you're going to pay dearly. So now, I didn't hear this from you, but I saw a photograph of you wearing a purple heart. You want to tell us about that? that it's obviously a medal that you don't want to get, but we were on a uh, mission into North Vietnam, and uh, on the fifth day, we are supposed to be getting pulled out that day, and uh, it was around noon, and um, I... We had been surrounded by these guys for that whole time that we were in, but um, I heard some noise off to the side of our position, 
and I went down there to crawl down there basically to see what was going on. And, um, and I heard some rustling, I knew it was some NVA coming up there. We were on a ridge. And uh, so I, I pulled out a grenade and I uh, pulled a pin out of the grenade. And uh, about that time I heard a thump up in front of me and the NVA down below me had thrown a grenade up towards me. And about then it goes off and um, I feel a searing pain in my neck. And so um, my first thought was to get rid of this grenade with the pin out of it. And um, I knew where that guy was and then put it down there and got him. And then everything erupts and we get into a big gunfight. So I, at one point I was up against a tree and these bullets started to hit right above my head in a tree and I rolled over on my side to get lower to the ground and the blood that had pulled in my lap just poured onto the ground like a bucket because I had bled that much in a short period of time. And then I just started to go into shock and my vision started to close down. And um, fortunately, um, Hung, our interpreter, got up to me, put a pressure bandage on there and got bleeding to stop. But when the helicopters came in, finally, and I can't tell a story without saying how courageous those guys were, because this was bad news all the way around. But they did, and um, we got back uh, to Da Nang, and uh, I consider it my best day of my life, because everybody was there was hugging us, and, you know, that whole, it was just a magnificent moment. Your best day. Yeah, definitely huh. my best day. All right, so after nine years, you left. Tell us a little bit about that and how you ended up as a writer. I had told myself when a, my dear friend Bill Brown was killed, and i just come back, and they told me that the whole team had been lost. And um, I took it stoically at the time. I just nodded because, you know, I'd heard that kind of news before. And, uh, but that night, I was walking by his hooch, and it was um, his, his parents had sent him a little artificial Christmas tree. And uh, before they went out on the mission, um, we had trimmed this Christmas tree. And that night, I'm walking past um, uh, the hooch, and the wind blew the door open, and I looked in the hooch, and there was that Christmas tree lit up. And um, I just fell to my knees. It was the only time I ever cried in Vietnam. And I, almost three years that I spent there. And I just fell to my knees and I sobbed. And uh, when I got up, I said that someday somebody was going to have to know about, about these people. And um, I, I decided then I was going to write a book about this. And um, when I got out, I went to college thinking that they could teach me how to write and quickly found out that they can't. And, uh, <laughs> um, but I also found out that I had the gift uh, of writing. And um, I was on that first sentence of that book for five years. And I was doing these nowhere jobs, just keeping myself alive, every night coming home and trying to start this book. When the first sentence came, at 25 yards the front side of the machine gun nearly covered the back of the resting soldier's head. That's, it started and I wrote the whole book in nine months. And, and had you and, not, and, had and, you not had that experience, you might not have even had the calling to write, who knows? Well, that's, that's exactly it. So I consider the, the three major blessings in my life to have been, one, being accepted in a special forces family, which is extraordinarily special. The second place, and a lot of people don't understand this, but is um, Vietnam. Because um, Vietnam provided the atmosphere for me to have the best friendships I will ever have in this life, and the deepest friendships. And the third blessing is here at the Daily Progress. This has, I love the Daily Progress, and it has given me the opportunity to do the most amazing things for all these years, to, to be standing right next door, or next 
to a, a search and harvesting a liver in a hospital in Beckley, West Virginia, and flying back with him and standing next to him as he puts the good liver in a person here at UVA. And, um, you know, it's just endless, all these opportunities that you get as a journalist that you wouldn't get in any other job. So it's just a, a great blessing. And, you know, you get people read your stuff. Yeah. <laughs> so well, what's better for a writer than to have people doing that? So. What's one of the, the most risky projects you've ever you know, attacked. Well, I'll tell you that the one that jumps to mind immediately is I did this guy who's coming here <laughs> to the area to um, have these people walk on coals, right? Oh, you, oh okay. Uh, the mm -hmm. um, 1200 degrees coals and it was some hoodoo there thing, you know, so everybody else is, is like taking a run and going tip, tip and they're off of them, right? But I said to myself, you know, I can't do that. You know, I'm a special forces guy. If I'm going to, if I'm going to walk on the coals, oh, I'm going to no. walk on the coals, okay. right? So I step off onto these 1,200 degree coals, and surprisingly enough, it felt exactly on my bare feet like burning hot coals would feel. <laughs> And I'm going, I'm in trouble here. <laughs> but what was really interesting is that it didn't really burn the soles of my feet like you would think. And you did write the article? I did indeed. It'd be interesting to see what you wrote. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I, I'll have to revisit that yeah, one. Yeah, we we'll definitely have to do that. that David, thank you. You're welcome.